How's it going, everyone? Nice to see you here again for another episode of Inside Fanatics Brush. I am Matt Scott, the insanely tired host of this show. Thank you for stopping by for week two episode of the LEC Spring Split Edition. Um, I've been super late on everything this week. Again, I almost missed my timing for the show because I went for the um, usual, oh, I'm just going to take like a, a quick power nap, quick half hour nap um, before getting up and doing what I need to do. And instead, I slept for like three hours and I woke up at like half seven. I was like, damn, I need to get stuff done here. Uh, so thank you guys for, for being on time as usual and tuning in. For this week too of the LEC, we've got quite a bit to talk about compared to, to week one. Week one was a bit of a stale and predictable week uh, with most of the big teams winning, being there where we expected them to be, Fnatic having a terrible 0 free start and looking somewhat even worse than where they were at the end of Winter Split. And this week, we have completely the contrary. We have probably one of the closest races we've had within the LEC with every team being, uh, I think, one point away from each other. We have Fnatic finally looking like a team and starting to make a comeback, potentially making uh, top eight. And as we're going into week three, we'll look at the predictions and see that we have still some bangers waiting for us. So how about that? How about that? Let's have a look straight away as what happened into the LEC. As you can see, the standings are as close as they can get. There's no clear cut top team as there used to be where you would have like one or two teams all the way at the top who were one, well actually more than two games away um, from the, the, the bottom of the, the teams in the standings. Here uh, we go from 4-2 to 2-4 and everything in between. And so right now we have SK, BDS, G2 and Vitality taking that first half of the standings. We have that little middle part with Astralis and Koi at 3-4 who, uh, you know, ha had a good start or and had a complicated week too or the other way around. I don't know why that SK logo is just floating here in space. And we have Excel, Mad Lions, Team Heretics, and Fnatic in the bottom half with mixed results, obviously, um, depending on how they got there. And I won't lie, looking at how the games went, I really struggled doing that top and flop ranking for, for this week. Well, specifically for the top ones because it was hard to find really outstanding teams who, you know, performed consistently well across the three days of the week and who didn't have that one game where it felt like, mm, do they really deserve to be at the top? So... I'll give a bit more arguments as to why I selected those teams at the top. You can tell me if you agree or disagree. Uh, head in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, obviously, or on uh, the Twitter at IFB Podcast if you have anything to add about this. If you would have maybe put a different team at the top, who knows. But first team that I put, which is, a, is an obvious one, is uh, Fnatic. Uh, 
just to go quickly over because we always have our Fnatic segment right after. Fnatic started again very poorly with the week, going 0 4. The game was pretty much done within the, the first few minutes, and I'll explain why later. Then progressively got better after a tumultuous game after t uh, I'm sorry against Team Heretics, I should say, and a much more cleaner game against uh, Koi, where we finally saw the potential of this team, and it didn't feel as gloom and doom. So scaling upwards, at least for for Fnatic, which is very encouraging or overall and makes them worthy of being in that top side of the teams of the week. Second team has been BDS. BDS have been slightly improving compared to uh, week one. They, um, what do you call it? Obviously had uh, a bit of a truck situation against G2 where it really felt like the game was theirs to win and from one thing leading to another within that game specifically they started losing their advantage G2 had the better team fights um, it was very weird how suddenly um, what do you call it BDS lost their advantage and I've read a few things about it one of them is being that um, what do you call it Broken Blade hasn't been the best during his laning phase which has allowed teams to kind of abuse uh, G2 uh, overall in the in the top lane and get some some wins notably like uh, Astralis who I think it's easy to argue that they're definitely not at the level that G2 has been able to, to showcase throughout, I'd say, the season overall. Uh, second part, I think, is that they've had very good uh, disengage against a hard engage comp and when executed properly, was able to outdo BDS in um, a proper, like, 5v5 and if i'm not mistaken the first sort of part of where g2 comes back into the game when they shouldn't is uh around drake on a 5v5 and when you have what's it akali um sejuani renekton who are full go in champions and you have azir you have um Gragas, you have Rakan to help you sort of push away but also control at the same time this very strong engage. Then, when executed properly, definitely gives uh, the advantage to, to G2 here. But still, I think that with the control and the advantage that they had. BDS should have won this, but it feels like G2 is really a team where you have to put their head on the ground and push them inside to really, if you really want to beat them completely, because they, they always have that comeback potential, which makes them a very complicated team to play. With that said, though, BDS has been playing overall really well. Um, they played against a very strong and upcoming uh, Astralis and obviously the game against um, Fnatic last week was kind of a, a bit of a one and done after after level one we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later but um, yeah definitely looking looking stronger much more cohesion within the, the team and uh, have been quite successful in keeping in that top half of uh, the standings with teams like G2, like Vitality, and SK. So well done to them. Out amongst them is also Koi. 
Now again, it's a bit of the same situation where you're like, why is Koi here? They got completely murdered by Fnatic. It doesn't make sense that you would put Fnatic and Koi. Well, again, it's the same reasoning of everyone got kind of beat during the week. I have to pick some people to put at the top. And to be very fair to Koi, right? Koi had a very shaky week one, um, you know, before going into that week two. Um, they definitely didn't look as strong or actually sorry l let me rephrase that the the progress that they had made during groups and playoff stage then translate through the first week of spring split right and so it felt like they it, it, it was kind of back to where they were at the beginning of winter split where they kind of sucked at the beginning and now they had to sort of bring back the potential level where they were at and i was the first surprised when i saw that they started beating teams like um sk and um who was it on on saturday no on saturday was sk no what was it sorry it was g2 and sk there we go sorry about that g2 and sk so especially beating g2 who again look absolutely insane and SK, who is also one of the top teams in uh, the standings right now. So they came in really, really strong. On top of the victories, it's how they won their game. It's that compared to week one, where they looked, again, kind of kind of frazzled, didn't have this identity that they sort of developed in the second part of Winter Split. If felt like they found it again much more structured in their way of, of playing the early to, to, to mid game um, Marong was again being very much of a, of a menace his ganks were better executed over the map overall and I don't know why oh, there we go um, and um, Koi really looked like they knew what they were doing um, across the games. Um, especially against um, the game on Saturday, which was the G2 one, right? Yes, I don't know why I keep confusing. Uh, but again, everyone expected G2 to win this, considering Koi's uh, recent form. And while it, it was rather close for I'd say roughly the first half of the game, you know, up until uh, 16 minutes with, I would give it a slight edge to, to G2 because I think that they had two drakes at this stage to, to none. Um, Koi was kind of still ahead in terms of gold, but G2 was always able to get some picks here and there it took i believe what was it again i think it was a a drake team fight to sort of shake things around uh shigenda doing really well on his uh nar which i think is kind of one of his better picks this uh this season and kind of snowballed it from there because I believe they rushed it straight to, to Baron at that point. It was uh, 4 for 2, I believe, with Shigenda and Comp still being alive. So that kind of accelerated uh, Koi's game at this stage. And um, G2 was trying too hard to sort of um not lose too much and instead starting losing more <laughs> than if they played a bit more conservative when they you know try to steal the, the the baron or chase them afterwards where koi did really well in that aspect is that they again they played the map really well now obviously there was 
enabled with Larson being on uh, Twisted Fate. This gives much more map mobility um, with also um, Shigenda playing a, a much more of a, of a 4-1 uh, type when they when they had um, the Baron. And, you know, even then, the ensuing team fights that came with, uh, what it was is that, um, how do you call it? G2 kind of overforced the team fights, thinking that they would just beat them on sort of pure skills and instead just got caught with, by, sorry, um, Koi's um, draft. Um, yeah, going a bit too far on, on the Vi, thinking that potentially his, his team would, would catch up. But yeah, um, yeah, it got kind of isolated and then it just kind of stumbled. From that team fight, Koi just marches on defeats G2 very clearly. Um, the the weaknesses that there are in G2 right now, especially around top lane, kind of resonated in this game. Um, I think Shigenda had a 5k gold difference uh, compared to Broken Blade. So again, there's opportunities here to sort of abuse even a team like uh, G2 who still feel very strong uh, this season so far. Um, so that's that's about it for the teams who have been at the top so far. Now, let's look at the other side with one that might shock people if, if you haven't watched the LEC this week. It is Vitality. Vitality going into, um, what do you call it? Into week two, undefeated, and who not only lost against G2, which I kind of predicted, uh, well, not even kind of, that I predicted um, for the, 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 the week two guesses, but who also lost to uh, Astralis. And it felt uh, that when they went into um, week two, they were definitely the better team across uh, the board, you know, um, with the addition of upset. And it's like, this is the final piece for Vitality to be a great team. And it's very weird because it feels that since they've got upset, Bo kind of sprints it a little bit during the whole game. I don't know if you guys seen the games, but Bo is going for way too many risky plays or just steps up when his team isn't around him and the only reason why Vitality is able to fight back is because of Photon Photon has been playing he, he has to be the best top laner right now still and is that against Astralis he pulled an incredible uh, TP behind their lines and really carried the, the, the team fight on his Gwen. But despite all of that, Astralis was just so far ahead that the sort of burst wombo combo plus a fully scaled um, Aurelian Soul just becomes absolutely disgusting to play. On top of that, um, Finn just has to sit pretty on his Scion, play the front line, while uh, Astralis plays front to back. And Vitality had no answers. Like their only answer was was Photon. Photon was the one that had the answer. And even then, you know, he was pulling off quadra kills. He was pulling off flanks, things like this. And it, it, it felt a little bit like he was in Elo Hell. I'll be very honest. Um, the, um, the sort of semi wombo combo that they had with the uh, Aurelian stole stole <laughs> the Aurelian so uh warp the Annie stuns the the Kobe um chains of corruptions with his virus 
it was it was too it was too complicated to handle and eventually when they get to fight 5v5 and go a bit like a aram in the mid lane astralis easily take over so i'm not too sure how astralis sorry not astralis. i'm not too sure how vitality goes in to uh week three because i think they have to find that identity that they had in week one again and not overcommit on you know that sort of lpl approach of see someone going on on, on someone because teams that have better synergy usually have their backs a bit better and therefore you, you'll never just get the pickle on it either it will be traded or you're the one who's gonna lose and that's how it's felt with uh, vitality it always felt that there were extensions they were the ones who were losing and it was never traded one for one so that's that's on the vitality side mad lions is kind of same on a downward trend and i'll say that they are the ones who surprised me the most along with also sk i should say but specifically mad lions who went so far in a previous split and i don't know what's going on this week they started really well with getting a win against Australis, who looked really hot then they lost against excel of all teams and then they lose against Team Heretics. They lost against what are potentially the some of the worst teams in the LEC. And when you see how tight the standings are, those are definitely the teams on which you want to get wins. Absolutely. And it's very hard to point the finger where it's going wrong because you'd want to think directly, oh, well, doesn't um, doesn't Mad Lions have a certain player called Hilly Sang? Surely he entered his ass off. That's not even the case. That's not even the case. It's not a case of Hilly Sang being like over eager and, and, and trying to get picks right, left and center. It feels like across the board, there's no one who, who stood up. Like wh which one was it? Was it the, I, the, the, the Excel game where they, they, they were getting the first few kills and suddenly they I don't know they over, well not overextend but they overcommit on Patrick who is have who had the, the performance of his life really during that game and was allowed to just hit his feathers on Xaya like nobody was able to to reach him I think he, he ends the game like completely undefeated. Scales into eternity. Uh, you know, you, you'd think with... Um, what's his name? Karzy being on, on Zeri. That eventually they would be a bit more competitive. Because whatever you do... If you, if you manage to stall the game with a Zeri on your team, she eventually gets two free items, goes into bullshit mode, and when supported by uh, a mage support with, I believe it's Lulu that they had, then it just becomes so annoying to, to deal with. And even then, it, it never felt like Excel struggled on that part. Like they, they didn't go to like 40 minutes where it was a, a constant battle against the, the Zeri. Nope. It was massive diff on, you know, the the bot side, I would say in general, both uh, Patrick and, and Limit. And I didn't expect that. With that said as well, um, there are more changes coming to... Uh, Excel. So we've seen that VTO has been struggling with uh, mental issues and or mental health, I should say, and that um, he's been replaced with Abadage, and then their coaching staff, Nelson, either has stepped down or has been put out. It's not very clear on how uh, 
um, Excel communicated this and has been replaced by Cas, who was at 100 thieves, I believe, in, in NA, came back uh, to EU after all. Um, after less than the length of a split in North America. So, not too sure. Does Fnatic auto qualify if they beat Mad Lions? I don't think so. If I remember what was showcased at PGL, but I believe it skyrockets their chances to qualify. I think it brings it up to around like a 90%. Um, what I think it does is that it at least allows them to get um, a tiebreaker. Unless there's like a very specific scenario that uh, that happens, uh, I believe that at least secures them um, a tiebreaker to, to qualify to top eight. So the, the the bar right now is to get at least three wins to to get into that scenario and not be immediately eliminated. So yeah, I'll, I'll say that it doesn't necessarily auto qualify them, but it, it prevents them from being uh, immediately eliminated. There you go. Hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so that was about my lines. To wrap it up, SK. SK again, kind of like Vitality, looking super hot coming into week two and start, you know, stumbling against teams that they shouldn't be. Um, losing against, well, I, I'd say, you know, before coming into the the, the season, uh, the season before coming into the week, um, they weren't necessarily thought to be losing against Koi. Vitality SK was obviously a bit of a of a, of a closer one. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a I'd say challenging week for SK. It was a it was a way for them to to prove themselves, and well, they they, they kind of failed to be honest. They managed to. You know, get a win against uh, Excel, which I think was really important because people were starting to question mark uh, SK's performance. But very clean game against uh, Excel. While it was it wasn't a very bloody game, I think there was a, maybe a handful of kills uh, across the the game. SK was in control the the whole time, so. Good bounce back from them, definitely. But against Koi, I'll say I was really surprised that they weren't the one who came out with the win. Um, it was against a case of Marang being on a very aggressive champion like Lee Sin and having his typical uh, over ganking uh, style, which, you know. It's a bit of a hit or miss, depending on, on how it's executed. But... The advantage was slightly SK at the beginning. But they started letting go of the pressure. And eventually, Koi just got the better team fights uh, overall. Um, I think they're very comfortable with their... Um, you know, hard engage comps with the... Um, I'm blanking. Um, Kaisa Rakan, which allows them to, to reposition, go in, go out. And, um, you know, with something like a Lee Sin, uh, a Jarvan for, for Marang. And I believe against Koi, they had. Uh, sorry, against SK. Um, Koi had another uh, NAR game on which. He is very good during laning phase and he's able to sort of extend into the, the mid to late game during the, the team fights. So, yeah, quite, quite surprising from SK. All of this gives us probably some of the closest standings that we've had uh, in, in recent times. 
I think there will be roster changes if we don't make it to best of three phase. Last play you said there won't be any roster changes. Okay. So, we're, we're talking about Fnatic now, and I'll get into it in our next segment, but just to answer those questions, uh, I'll start with the um, not changing members part. I believe that was it after... I think I said this after week one that we probably wouldn't get any roster changes because we were looking to sort of uh, build into the season. Now, I wasn't expecting us to be this bad where it looked like the whole team was dead. And afterwards, it felt inevitable to have uh, changes. So for me, at the time, it didn't make sense to, to make changes thinking that, well, we're not we're not performing really well. But still, um, there there is space to grow. There are free splits. Give it some time. Um, but it got very bad very quickly. So it made sense to, to make changes. And I agreed at the end of the split that, you know, players, staff, whatever, some something had to move because... Um, it was beyond performance. It was really about the environment within the team. And you can see that it's reflected right now on with Nightshare coming in, Oscar and Adrian really changing up the vibe. You have guys like Razork as well, who are very, um, you know, candid about the fact that they appreciate a bit more their current environment within the team. Now, if we don't make top eight uh, this time, I won't change my stance. I don't believe that we will make changes for two reasons. The first one, which I think is the most obvious one, is that it doesn't make sense to constantly make changes every time something is wrong, right? You either want to build with what you have or risk into going into another adaptive phase of saying, you know what, we have to make changes, we have a new roster, uh, we have to make it click again and blah, 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 blah. It makes sense, to, well, I mean, it makes sense, but it's very hard to do during winter because of the way the other leagues are structured. But because there's two more splits to be played, if you want to make changes, you want to do them right now. If you make changes after spring split, you're like, well, you know what? We're going to make changes for at minimum nine more games. And if it doesn't work, it's like, well, you've gone through God knows how many players, God knows how many contracts. And I think it becomes very hard to manage all of this because like how many players are you going to have on the bench? Are you gonna, you know, you're not. Are you gonna sell them? Are you gonna put them as a as a free agent? So you're gonna lose money. It's. I think it's too much of a struggle. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is that we have a rookie like Oskarinen, and while he has had a very complicated start, I think it would be terrible that after nine games, we already put him out. Because there's definitely much more potential to him. He's still very, you know, new to the scene and still still adapting to this new level of, of competition. But he's showcased what he's able to do. You know, he, he is very smart with the game. He's very good mechanically. He just sort of forgets that he's in the LEC, you know, and that players are much, much more smarter, uh, more smart isn't, uh, isn't correct, they're much smarter, um, they, they're more precise in their movements and in their positioning, and that, you know, they, they'll easily bait you into, into a gang, so... Even if we go 0-3 next week, which I really don't think is going to happen, um, 
I doubt that we change. I think it makes more sense to build, especially when you look how well it's going within the team in terms of the vibes in general and to continue on that and on the work that Nightshare is uh, is doing with this team. So that that'll be my my point of view and it'll be a great segue into our Fnatic segment that I've called a new hope. If you guys are a Star Wars fan, you you will have gotten the reference here. But talking about this week, it actually feels really good. Finally. It's not a gloom and doom segment that we've had for the past few weeks. Um, it did start really bad, to be honest, against BDS, where, like I mentioned earlier, it felt like we lost at level one. Um, we go for a Caitlyn Lux Bolin, which I was pleasantly surprised with. Of like, oh. Damn, we're going with a really aggressive bot lane. We're getting Caitlyn back on, on Reckless. And um, we are, we're doing something that's much more proactive than just farming and waiting to skill for our items. Unfortunately, um, we lose immediately level one uh, with... I mean, that's the way I see it, right? Maybe there's more to it, but Advian positioning way too aggressively. Uh, against the Blitzcrank and getting caught immediately. Which kind of fucked up everything because the way this lane is meant to work is that you want Lux and K to continue, continuously push the enemy under their turret, get the plates and just really scale super hard. The moment Caitlyn gets behind, it's a 4v5 the rest of the game. So while it wasn't necessarily doom and gloom straight away, it became very, very, very complicated to win the game. You add that, that a few minutes afterwards, um, Razor goes top lane to put some pressure, get a gank. Um, Adam steps uh, steps away to, to prevent this from happening. And Skyrim backs Shio is right here in the tri brush, catches him while he's recalling with Razor right next to him, and it's just unfortunate timing. And right there is like within the span of a few minutes, we're already losing on the side lanes. What I will say though is that we fought super well after that. Despite being super behind, we didn't give up. We got a good team fight at one point, I believe around one of our inhibitors, and we didn't let go completely. And I think that this in particular is a great sign because I don't know if it would have necessarily been the same with the previous iteration of this team, where it felt like it had given up already <laughs> within champ select, right? So at least, there's some form of encouragement. They push each other. They still fight, and they they see if they can snatch uh, a win back, which I appreciated very much. Going into the Team Heretics game was a bit scary, right? Because I believe Team Heretics had won their game when they were zero three, and it was like, well, at least we're battling with another zero three team, and instead they beat XL against which we had lost. So you're you're feeling, hmm, they beat a team against we, we lost and we're meant to be this team who's supposed to be one of the worst teams as well. Fortunately, what happened is that we go into a hard engage comp with, um, what was it? Um, the, the Nautilus and Xayah in the bot lane, very, very aggressive, good disengage as well. We pull out Jax for a Skyrim, which I thought was insanely ballsy uh, to, to do. And the, was it Talia? Talia Vi? Is that what we went for? 
Did we get Vi two games in a row? Yeah, it was Vi. It was Vi, which is, you know, a pretty good uh, mid-jungle combo, which is something we've been trying to really make work uh, within this team. Uh, but with Vi either getting the stun with her Q or the knock-up, allowing the Unraveled Earth and the knockback. Um, you know, it was it was pretty decent. It was pretty decent overall. The game caught kind of difficult, although uh, with the very good start where Oscarnin gets a triple kill, which is amazing on a, on a big carry pick like Jax. And we get the first blood on the bot lane to, to gain the advantage. Um, because I feel like we were kind of unsure how we wanted to play the, the team fights. Uh, you know, if if you watch the ones, especially around um, around Drake, it's always a case of humanoid trying to find an angle to, you know, split Team Heretics in two, and then we we managed to, you know, maybe catch one or two. Usually it was Evi who, uh, you know, always got separated from the team, obviously playing frontline, or getting hooked by Abjen, who was really good on his uh, not list during that game and the thing is is that some of those engages were really poor and if we didn't burst down the Jarvan or the Sion who were isolated they were able to poke back with the Zeri and the Azir and you'll see there's a lot of team fights where um, you know Razork and um Oscarinen are trying to jump on that person and before they get they banish to burst him down they're already half HP or they get killed instantly with all the poke so then it comes down to uh, the rest of the team to sort of not completely get destroyed at the end uh, thankfully we had m much more control over the drakes during those team fights but the problem is like how how we were playing with those drakes right it was you had Reckless, who was trying his best to secure laying all the feathers and doing the, the 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 blade recall. I think that's what it's called to burst it down. And the rest of the team was like, "No, we we isolated someone. We have to go in on him straight away." So that made it very complicated. We lost the team fight with the Zeri going insane. It felt like the same game against them during winter, where we were ahead and then suddenly. We were going too hard on the Zeri and we eventually lost the game. Thankfully, amazing performance from Humanoid and Reckless, who hit the deeps, as we say. Um, I think especially Humanoid, who did really well during those team fights when it was really touch and go at some point. He managed to really catch the Zeri out of position multiple times and allow his team to just sort of jump on her and collapse and and uh, and make the difference because the Zeri was starting to scale in a very scary place and we definitely had to you know remove her from the team fight as fast as possible um, with that said wasn't a great game uh, overall but it allowed us to have our first win which I think played a big part in sort of unlocking the team's mentality because it's very important that you sort of get out of a losing circle of saying we're losing we're losing we're losing we're a bad team we're never going to achieve anything whatsoever so we really need to get that first win to tell ourselves that we're capable of winning which my opinion is the most important part to get back into a winning streak and that's what we started doing with the koi game koi game before going in looked i wouldn't say like an impossible game but it looked even harder than what we were expecting going into week two koi just beats sk and uh, G2, which are some of the, the top teams in the league. You know, like, damn. 
they just beat some of the best teams right now and we have to face them when we've just had a very scrappy, a very close game against Team Heretics despite uh, an insane early game that should have, you know, instantly giving us, given us the, the, the win uh, afterwards. And one of their first lock-in is Callista Tarek. When you know how good comp is on Callista and how much this combo can be very annoying to, to play against with the Callista ult into the Tarek stun into the Tarek ult where it just gives more time for Callista to you know stack uh, those uh, arrows into you and then rend them to, to, to create massive burst damage I wasn't feeling uh, too confident however Fnatic probably had some of their better answers in draft than they've had the whole uh, split because that has been also a big issue has been the, the draft during the season and I feel like this week we've, um, we've improved drastically on our on our drafting and I think this this final game really helped out um, when you're, you're you're drafting against a very hard engage comp uh, with a lot of burst as well it prevents Callista and Tarek to do Callista and Tarek stuff um, what I mean by that is that while the Callista has a lot of mobility with her passive um, if th there's very easy lock-in uh, spells on the enemy team she becomes less of a threat so you have the Vi ult you have Nautilus Q, you have Nautilus ult you have uh, Xayah who can pile her feathers get the stun on her E all these things to just make sure that nothing too weird happens and that Callista goes crazy um, on the enemy team that was very well thought out in general that was a very good answer to um, this bot lane pick um, on top of that you also prevent too much um, hard engage against the Callista ult the um, was it was playing the the Lee Sin and the Nar by having um, an Azir on your team who's able to Sharima wall away any instant engage. So I felt like all the layers were were covered, and a bit like the game against Team Heretics, Advian uh, gets an incredible um, hook on his uh, Nautilus gets us the first blood and it feels like really Nautilus is our, is our pick to go uh, right now That's, that was such an impressive performance by him like across the game he manages to catch the enemy carries he manages to catch the Callista multiple times he manages to catch the Lee Sin uh, he managed to catch um, Twisted Fate as well so that was done very well Oskarnin, you know, played a little cheeky on his lane, but did well overall. Cut back uh, eventually into the mid game. The team fight were super, super crisp. Um, I think most of the team fights we actually went five for zero. So deathless team fights, very well organized. Everyone hitting their their DPS. And it was just a cleaner game overall, which I don't think anyone expected from the team. Um, you know, not, nothing too scrappy where it felt like, oh, Koi might bring it back. Um, it was absolute domination overall. Um, I think we get something like 20 plus kills uh, when the, within the end. Uh, Dragon Soul, we get Baron. Everyone played super well. Specifically, Razork, who had an insane MVP performance. This guy was all over the place. Gets a good uh, gank in, in the bottom. Chases Marang into his jungle when he gets brought down very low. Catches him on his wolves. So, puts him even 
further back. Uh, he just took absolute control of the game. Something that I appreciated very much as well is that he didn't go for his absolutely mental overextended plays where he's ulting with Vi 10 screens away from the rest of his team. So this sort of, you know, slightly more conservative uh, gameplay was very well appreciated, at least on my side. And he picked his battles uh, much better. So, no, very happy on, on how he performed. It feels like he's getting his mojo back again, his confidence back again. And if he's able to perform at the top level as he's done previously, then I think that we're going to look much better going into the next weeks. And, you know, if you guys watch Legends in Action um, for, for week two, you'll see that, you know, the sickness definitely really um, impacted the players during week one, specifically uh, Reckless. Now they're starting feeling a bit better. So I think they definitely, uh, you know, had something to do with their, their performance. On top of that, you can see that synergy and vibes are super great within the team. Everyone's taking responsibility. Um, Nightshare did something that I thought was really interesting with the team where everyone kind of says, you know, the pros and cons of every one of their teammates. So being as open as possible, knowing what elements you want to, you know, you want to play with and which one you want to improve on. So I think just overall, absolutely amazing from from the team and now the challenge is being able to keep that momentum um what i will say is that while i think we've started finding our play style i hope that we're able to transition this with different comps because what's worked for us is getting the xia nautilus bot lane and Razork on Vi. And sort of interchanging top mid uh, picks. I'm wondering if if we don't get the Nautilus, if we don't get the Vi, if we don't get the, the Xaya, if we're able to perform as comfortably as we have on these two games, uh, last two games of, of week two. So in my opinion, this is where the challenge is going to lie within the team. Um, definitely is are we able to go a bit further in terms of our draft are we still able to perform really well um, are we really you know going to continue on that momentum or is it really related to the way we've structured our, our drafts so far so I really hope we have much more in the tank uh, than what we've showcased but still big congratulations uh, to the boys very happy to, to see them get some wins. Looking more cohesive uh, overall. Looking like a real team. Much more dominant and clear progression uh, going forward. Uh, was that, in my opinion, Fnatic not firing uh, Nightshare no more? No, I, I mean, the, it would be very weird to fire Nightshare. Even if he wasn't performing well, just you don't want to go through 10 different coaches um, during the split. And I think Nightshare is doing a, a good job by creating a unit within the team and setting clear goals on you know how to improve what challenges to tackle and what elements they they need to work on the most so you know again he was praised quite a bit by by people in the scene and so far it seems to be working out the real test is going to be on week three where we're going to see if we're able to to snowball on our progress speaking of which let's have a quick look at the predictions scores are still as close as it can get 35 to 36 you guys still have the lead on this one uh, roughly have the same expectations uh you did you guys really vote for excel surely not did i get this right Let's see, let's see. We create a one. So I know you guys voted for Koi. 
Why did I not change this? Astralis, Koi, Aitati, Fnatic, and G2. Yeah. My bad, guys. Let me change that real quick. There we go. Bish, bash, bosh. Let's make it nice and neat for you guys. Um, only comment I'll have on this week is Vitality BDS could go either way looking at um, recent forms. I was going to try something spicy and maybe vote for uh, BDS, but part of me said there's a chance that Vitality fix uh, some of the issues that they had during week two and come in much stronger uh, there. But if BDS wins, I won't be surprised. So you heard it here first. Potential BDS win in uh, day one. Looking at week uh, sorry, not week, sorry, looking at day two. Uh, da, 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 same stuff. You guys voted for Fnatic versus G2. I did a bit of a coward pick. I went for G2. I don't think we're at that level yet. If we beat G2, we just win worlds. Listen, I don't make the rules. It's just how it is. Um, but no, it would be super impressive, I think, if we beat G2. Even if G2 hasn't looked super fresh lately, um, I still think they're very very impressive uh, overall and top two uh, still um koi bds you guys went for it with koi which you know i think is an honest choice i still think bds might have a, a slight edge but you guys you guys might have it on this one not too sure final week same results um looking at the games Koi Vitality could be interesting. Koi could win. Astralis Fnatic, really, really hoping. I think, in my opinion, this game is going to determine really where we are. Because Astralis is playing super, super well right now. And I think if we're able to beat uh, Astralis, we're looking good going into the best of threes. Which, you know, if, if our previous predictions are correct, should automatically uh, qualify them uh, for that. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to see three very good games with qualifications at the end for, for Fnatic. Because not only do we need this, but it will have showcased that we're actually making progress um, overall. So, an exciting week three, guys. A super exciting week three. Everything to be played for. Standings are as close as they can get. So the door is open for, for Fnatic. There's plenty of scenarios for them to, to qualify. It's all about, you know, not not missing that opportunity now and uh, capitalizing on the victory. So that's about it, guys. Thank you for tuning in, as usual. I appreciate it. Uh, leave any comments you want on the YouTube on what you think about week three some of the predictions, some of your expectations, and hopefully we qualify so we can actually have another episode next week uh, because last time we didn't qualify and I pretty much stopped the podcast during the rest of the, the split. So um, it gives me more free time, but I enjoy doing the podcast. So guys, fingers crossed. We were looking good this week and we can go a bit further into the competition and get into the best of free format. Again, thank you for tuning in. Love you guys. And remember, always fanatic. Bye-bye.